Welcome back to Seeker Strength and welcome back to Seeker Stand. Here are 16 tips to make your year of training in 2024 the best year of training ever. The first tip is have fun. Enjoy training. I know this sounds kind of corny, it sounds kind of cheesy, but it is so true. To be honest, if we're being realistic, a lot of us here watching this video and even the people making it aren't going to be professional athletes. We are not going to be world championships level athletes we're not going to go to the olympics unless we're going watching so the primary goal for training the reason you still train and most of you are watching this is not so much the mental health stuff it's not the physical benefits it's not your physical health the main reason you train is because you love training so make sure that you enjoy training in 2024 be a process oriented athlete enjoy every session even if you're just trying to get to an 80 kilo snatch or a 120 kilo back squat or a sub five hour marathon, whatever it is, just enjoy the training. Don't worry about where you stack up against anyone else. Just enjoy that process. Enjoy every single session. You'll find if you enjoy them, you'll make better decisions more consistently and you'll end up with a much better year overall and you'll be much happier with the training and the results you end up with. Dovetailing into that one nicely is number two, and that's have realistic goals. So obviously, all of us like to sit down at the start of January, plan out what we want to achieve. We want to talk about the weights we want to hit, the body weight, the body composition we want to be, certain performance outcomes we might want to have. And oftentimes, we get a bit lost because maybe we're looking at things that might happen in five years time or things that might happen after 10 years of training or maybe things that would happen if we had started training five years previously and we lose a sense of realism with those goals. We have big long videos on goal setting, the smart goal setting system, but the number one thing for 2024 is to be realistic with yourself. If you put five kilos onto your squat for the last five years, you're probably not gonna put 25 kilos onto your squat right now, but you could certainly put five or 10 kilos onto the squat in the next year. Number three is have an actual plan. This is so important and we say this every year and we talk about this all the time, but plan out your year to the best of your ability. You don't have to plan out every single session, the minutia, the exact sets and reps and the weights you're gonna use, but you do have to have a high level plan. Let's say, for example, you are a rugby player or you're a sprinter, you're in the off season, you know for the next couple of months that you've this style of training to be doing, you have this range that you need to hit in terms of performance, you know have certain strength goals you need to hit, and then you have a pretty good idea of how you're going to move from those strength goals back to your in-season work. If you're a weightlifter, if your squad is kind of weak, or if you've competitions and you've multiple different competitions, have a plan. Have a pretty good approximate plan and have realistic actual segments of training that will make sense. Don't go, okay, I'm going to improve my squat by 20 kilos and then I'm going to increase my snatch and clean and jerk by 20 kilos also, make the qualifying championship for nationals and then six weeks later do nationals and add another 20 kilos. You know that's not realistic. So have a quality, intelligent plan. Again, it doesn't have to be exactly what you're going to do, but the broad strokes of that plan need to be set out. It's so useful because you know what you need to be doing. Don't go into the year just hoping and thinking, okay, I'm gonna get better at weightlifting and then wing it. Don't go into the year thinking, right, I'm gonna make provincial rugby teams. Think, what am I going to do? What do I need to do based on those goals I've set, those realistic goals I've set, and then set up your plan to the highest level that still makes sense. Number four is have the appropriate body comp that you need for your particular goals. This is one that kind of flies under the radar a little bit, and we talk about this quite frequently, is have the appropriate body comp included in your plan for the year of 2024 and know how you're going to get there. Don't think, okay, I'm going to gain 20 kilos in body weight, add 40 kilos to my back squat, cut 20 kilos again in body weight, be leaner than I've ever been, have more muscle mass, and keep all that strength. That's not realistic, but... Assess your body comp that you need, and most of the time, the body comp for most sports, unless you're super heavy in weightlifting or powerlifting, is have less fat and more muscle. Now, this is simply said, but not easily done, and this is something that'll take a lot of planning with your programming and a lot of realistic planning, working with your coach, maybe working with a nutrition coach, and seeing where you're at. You know, if you're six foot three and you're 80 kilos and you want to be the best weightlifter, you know that's probably not the best body weight. And you might think that sounds realistic, but the amount of time we meet people over six foot and they say, I'm 80, 85 kilos body weight. <laughs> I want to, what weight do you think I should be? Am I underweight? And you're like, yes, you are underweight. But conversely, if you're five foot four, you're in the 60 kilo jiu-jitsu category, but you're 25% body fat, 
you know that's not the best place to be at to maximize your competition performance and your performance for that support. So really assess your body comp. It might be okay now and you might need to maintain it and make sure you maintain it or you may need to make some drastic changes but make sure you plan accordingly. Look at things when it comes to body comp in three, six and a year long progress. Number five then is get a coach or get some good information. A lot of the time, once we've been training for a certain period, maybe it's five years or maybe it's eight years of lifting weights, we tend to get fairly stuck into a rut of this is how I do my strength training, this is how I do my conditioning, this is how I do my nutrition. But oftentimes there's much more we could be learning and much more new aspects we could be bringing into our programming, into our technical prowess, into our overall training and how we approach being an athlete. So for this, there's never been a better time. Most information is available fully free of charge online. You just have to spend the time either reading it, watching it or listening to it online. Go out there with a specific plan for what you're going to learn. Maybe in the first six months of this year, you want to really approach your strength training with a level of specificity you haven't approached it previously. Go and look at YouTube pages like ours or hundreds of other really, really good sport and exercise scientists or coaches or just general content creators. Start sifting to what's good information, what's bad information. Maybe you'll go and review some of the old paper reviews we used to do. Talk about what's good in a paper, what's bad in a paper and really start honing in on what's the good information or what's good information for me in this particular period of time. There are really, really good educational resources out there. People make great videos every single day, but they're often not applicable to you in your particular situation. And so you can watch that video or read that blog post and say, oh, I really agree with what this person is saying. This is really concurrent with what I feel in my own head or what my current values are but it might be the best information for you right now. You might understand that concurrent training is great for weightlifters, but you might need a very significant strength block right now. And so concurrent training can kind of go on the back boiler for a while. Don't concentrate on it right now. So when you're looking for good coaching, when you're looking for good information, make sure firstly that it is good information. And then secondly, that that information applies to you right now. Not necessarily that it kind of conforms with your current values, but that it confirms with your current goals. Number six is get unidirectional in your goals. So this is a problem that's been arising a lot more in recent years with the rise of hybrid athletes, not lucky in anyone, but this is something that is a little bit of a problem for a lot of people when you're not the most well-trained, when you're newer to sports, or you don't have the right information and set up for those particular goals. So. For example, in Dara's case, if he's trying to do a five minute mile in a 500 pound back squat, that is the particular goal. And he understands that he is reducing his ultimate capacity in either one of those disciplines, but his actual goal is to do both of those at the same time. Now, where this becomes a problem is a lot of times people will still want to be the best they possibly can at multiple different sports. A very frequent one currently is someone will be like, I want to do jujitsu and weightlifting. And you're like, okay, how long have you been doing weightlifting? And you're like two or three years. Have you started jujitsu yet? No. And the answer then is kind of like, look, I know you kind of, I know you're really enjoying weightlifting or you might have already started jujitsu or something similar like that. It happens so often where you might think you want to do both of them and you might think you can do both of them but you might not be realizing just how much you're going to be holding back your progress and a lot of times that's not really what people want to do so for example in that weightlifting and jiu-jitsu case it's perfectly fine to test the waters and see how the jiu-jitsu goes and practice your weightlifting in the meantime and understand that you're probably not going to do this for quite long and you're going to return to weightlifting that's fine but what the issue arises is when someone really loves weightlifting but they kind of love the idea of kind of skating from one goal to the other while doing weightlifting is that you're really holding back your progress and this can be in many different formats but I really encourage you to fee get super specific with your goals and this is kind of as we're saying something that arises more than ever and it's not so much that people understand that I'm going to reduce my capacity for those other goals is they kind of think there must be a way I can balance them but ultimately there really isn't I'll give you a personal anecdote I have doing jiu-jitsu for just over two years now and as many of you know I squatted 300 kilos recently which is while I would say this as humbly as possible it's a massive life's goal for me it's also something that globally in relation to squatting is quite a high tier goal and while I was doing jiu-jitsu and getting closer to the end of that kind of training block 
a couple of months out, I reduced my jiu-jitsu from three times a week to two times a week. And then slowly, well, actually at the start of the year, went from about four to five times a week and very slowly titrated off until near the end. For the last about six weeks, I was doing one session of jiu-jitsu a week and really reduced the amount of actual rolling I was doing. And this was because ultimately, if you're trying to be the best you possibly can be at one individual goal, reducing and making your direction as straightforward and as narrow and as focused as possible is the best and basically the only way you can maximize your performance. So get specific with your goals, pick one of those goals like we're saying and be very, very diligent with chasing that one goal. Number seven then is get sleep and it cannot be any simpler than this. At the start, don't be concerned about sleep hygiene, sleep quality you don't need to be wearing a strap on your wrist that tells you how great your sleep was you just need to allocate a certain amount of time that you're going to get each night and then you need to schedule it in like you'd schedule in time for anything else a lot of us get really concerned with the blue light blockers we might really be concerned about the uh, amount of time we're clocking in deep sleep and and less deep sleep that's really not important at this point What's vitally important at this point is that you get sleep every night. So a lot of us, as we're going Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we'll probably get the correct amount of sleep. We'll probably be in there for somewhere between seven and nine hours. We'll probably have a pretty consistent bedtime, pretty consistent wake up time. But as we get later on in the week, and then particularly as we get later on in those training cycles, the wheels tend to come off a small bit. So the number one thing we're saying right now is just get sleep, schedule it in, Try and be as consistent as you possibly can with your bedtime. Try and just understand that by maybe 10.30 or 11 p.m. every night, you're putting all your work away, you're putting Netflix away, you're going to be in bed and trying to get to sleep at that time. And then after that, we can start looking at the quality of our sleep. We can maybe look at something like Seek Asleep as a nutritional supplement to improve the quality of your sleep. You could also then look at the blue light blockers. You can look at your overall sleep hygiene and see, can we eke out those extra few percent? But at this point, the extra few percent don't matter at all because an extra 2% in sleep quality won't make up for the two hours of sleep you missed because you stayed up watching that series a bit later than you should have, or maybe you needed to go to work a bit early in the morning, so you had to get up a bit earlier and you missed out on those extra two hours. As an athlete or somebody who just recreationally trains, nothing will replace sleep in terms of your recovery, in terms of your overall skill learning, so just getting better at squatting, getting better at lifting weights, nothing will improve it more than having more quality sleep and being more consistent with that. Number eight is set up your life to match your goals. So this is a very, very important one. And like we talked about already, most of us watching this aren't professional athletes or will never be a professional athlete. So you really need to assess how important should training be in your life. Not how important is training in your life right now, but really assess how important should training be to you in terms of your family, your career, your friendships, your other hobbies, how important does training need to be? And very often, paradoxically, the more appropriately we put training into our life, the better our training actually gets. So if we're in a place where you're an amateur weightlifter and you're trying to set up absolutely everything you do to improve your weightlifting, but realistically, you will never make a national team, you'll never make an international team. And it's very, very important to understand that you're actually negatively affecting multiple aspects of your life, which eventually will end up affecting your training. So what's far more appropriate is if you get very specific with where training goes in your life. And it's not a bad thing to acknowledge that, look, my career is more important, my family is more important for me at this particular time in my life, and understand that if I put training in that appropriate place, if it's number three or four on the list, know that when you get to those sessions, you're gonna have way less stress around those sessions. You're probably gonna make better quality decisions. You're gonna make less dumb decisions because you've regulated training to its appropriate space. Again, I'll give you another personal anecdote. If a lot of you are watching the training vlogs leading up to the 300 kilo squat, you'll know that I talked a lot about the squat was number three in my priority list for my life. Like I was never going to, during the week, I was never gonna train essentially while my son was awake in the evenings. I was never gonna take time away from work. We are essentially our own bosses here and we could leave at any time to do anything. I could have left during the day to train at the prime time of maybe half two in the evening where just after lunch where I'm the most awake. But I never did that because those were priorities. That doesn't mean I don't enjoy training. That doesn't mean I don't take training very, very, very seriously. 
I just understood that the priorities are more important, one and two, and training comes third. Training was often done at half nine, 10 o'clock at night, and that's not the most ultimate optimal time for training for sure, but it ensured that my family life was of higher quality. It ensured that my business life is of higher quality. And in turn, this allowed me then to be much happier on average with everything that's going on. Whereas if I prioritized training, it wouldn't have been a whole lot better. I don't think I would have hit any higher number and likely the stress and the negativity that it would have impacted on the other areas of my life would have been much worse. So really assess where it is, you know, it's sometimes we get athletes who are kind of amateurs and will never be professionals taking this almost too seriously to put that in inverted commas. And I would really encourage you to get a bit more relaxed, a little bit more chilled out with us. And I actually, we can almost guarantee you that your training will be better because of this and the rest of your life will go a lot better. Number nine then is don't treat sport like a religion. So this goes for sports, this goes for training, this goes for your nutrition. A lot of the time we'll latch on to something and maybe we really appreciate the, the other people who are pushing that message. Maybe we really enjoy the content that they put out and we'll suddenly latch on to something and hold that as if it's the almighty word that's come from the YouTube realms to save us. If we're doing something in our own training and maybe it's not working out, maybe you're following a certain uh, period of somebody else's training and you start getting some inflammation around your knees maybe you're following somebody else's training and following some of their methodologies with their technique and it's not really working for you because maybe a difference in overall capacity but maybe just a difference in body size and shape in those cases you have to understand there's a point where you have to leave go you can really enjoy what they the message they press on you, you can really enjoy watching their training, but it wouldn't really be the best thing for you possible to follow along with what somebody else is saying if you start seeing deviations in their route that mightn't really suit you best. Number 10 then is act like an athlete. So a lot of us, when we start lifting weights, we, maybe we've played some sport before and maybe we had great habits around nutrition, around hydration, around our recovery in general. Suddenly we start lifting weights, maybe we're not in a team sport anymore and we can start to deviate away from the best practices a small bit faster. So maybe we're starting to eat some jellies during training sessions and that's great. Keeps our blood sugar levels up, starts replenishing that glycogen we're using. But suddenly it goes from maybe half a dozen small little jelly babies to a packet of jelly babies during every training session of the week. We inherently know that that's not the best pathway for most people to do. We probably know ourselves that I don't need that much sugar right in the middle of that training session. And we know it's not what an athlete would usually do. This goes the same way with your hydration, goes the same way with your recovery protocols. The final part of acting like an athlete comes down to some of those sacrifices that Owen talked about earlier. So athletes probably aren't going to the club or drinking or eating barbecue multiple times per week. You're just being, that same word again, reserved over the course of the week. Understanding that you want to treat yourself like an athlete, you want to have the same outcomes that they might have or at least move towards them. And so just having that in the back of your mind all the time that I'm going to treat myself like an athlete, I'm going to act like an athlete, you'll get much better outcomes for 2024. Number 11 is efficient training is far better than effective training. Now, what does that mean? So effective training, and we're all aware of the Bulgarian weightlifting team, would have employed a methodology of training that was train as much as possible, as heavy as possible, take as many drugs as possible. It doesn't matter who gets injured as long as someone comes out on top. That's an effective way of training because we know eventually we're going to get those results, take as many drugs as possible and get there in the end. But an efficient training is training to the best of your ability in the most intelligent way at that particular time. So again, another example, a lot of you would have been following the squatting training that I was doing recently. And the style of training that I did was based on something that uh, Toshiki Yamamoto mentioned in Japan. And I talked about this at the start saying that, look, this is a dumb idea, but I'm going to give it my best go just to see what happens as a, as a challenge as a war. So this was a very inefficient way of training. It essentially eliminated all my other capacity to do any other training in the gym. I couldn't do any Olympic lifts. I couldn't do any deadlifting. I didn't do any accessory work. All I did was squat and cardio. Now it was a very effective way because it eventually near enough to the end, I still had to make it more efficient. I still had to reduce the number of squatting sessions and I still had to change the loading 
Toshiki, as you might have known, was talked about an incredible peak from one week to the next. He essentially peaked for his 321. But there's a much more efficient way of training. And it's if you've run any of our programs or if you use the Seeker Strength app, you will know that we're all about efficient training. Now, efficient training doesn't mean training easy. It doesn't mean training stupid. It just means doing as much work as that session's called for, as much work as that week called for, as much work as that block calls for, and no more. There's no need to do extra when you don't need to do extra. A lot of times people will ask, can I squat four times a week? And you're like, you can squat four times a week. You can get better squatting four times a week. But what happens when you've added 10 kilos to your 170 kilo squat? Where will you go? Will you keep squatting four times a week until you get to 20? What will your other training goals do? How will you improve your other aspects of your training? Far better to change to two squat sessions a week and give yourself a capacity to do the rest of your training. At the moment, I'm doing a lot of bodybuilding sessions and I try my best to get those bodybuilding sessions done within 30 minutes or less. I want to get them done as efficiently as possible, do the volume I need to do and get out. And that's really important. And it's, again, ties into those other aspects of being an athlete appropriate goal setting, a probably placement of training in your life. The more efficient you are with training, the better it will go and the better it will gel with everything else you're doing. Number 12 then is probably my favorite in the whole list and it's stop copying your friends. We see it every single week. Somebody will start doing pause squats. Suddenly we'll see a lot of pause squats popping up. Owen will be doing five by fives. We'll see a lot of people doing five by fives the week after. They'll probably keep going for a week or two or three, maybe, and then they'll fall off the wagon again and go back to what they were doing or go on to the next thing. This is commonly referred to as squirrel programming, running over here, getting a bit of this, running over here, getting a bit of this, running over back here. And it is incredibly inefficient and really, really damaging to your overall progress. So even though we really enjoy watching other people train, we can learn a lot from watching other people train, but you don't need to copy them immediately once you see them doing that. Just because somebody else is suddenly going off and maybe going down a different route with their training, you do not need to go and copy them immediately. Oftentimes we see something, we'll say, oh, that could be really effective for me, but it's not something we need to jump into immediately. So if we've gone through all the lists so far and we've made our goals and we've made a plan and we understand where we're going with our training, we can look at other people training, we can appreciate why that might be useful, but you don't need to go and copy them right now. Number 13 is stop being a bitch. Now this is something that you might sound, it might sound like we're going against all the other things we were saying, but there's a lot of times in training where you just need to stop being a bitch. Now this isn't a particular derogatory take against one sex. This is going for everyone who watches these videos in your training. There's a point in your training where you just need to stop being a bitch and just finish that training session, do those sets, get over that little niggle you have, just eat the food you're supposed to eat, do the sessions you're supposed to eat. Sometimes it's going to be hard. Stop looking six weeks ahead in the program and thinking, oh, I can't do that session. Just stop being a bitch. Do the sessions you need to do them. Get them done as you need to do them. Don't think about it too much. Stop wondering what the weights feel like as you're warming up. If you're warming up to 150 kilo squat, stop thinking at eight. You're like, does this feel kind of heavy today? No, just shut up and stop being a bitch. And I think that's one of the best things you can implement this year is get after it a little bit more in your session. Yes, be efficient. Yes, do what the program says, but do it in a much more aggressive fashion, in a much more dominant fashion. Get in do your session, don't complain about it, don't think about it all day, don't be thinking about how heavy that's going to be in a week's time, just stop being a bitch. Number 14 is go down the well-worn path. You're not some Robert Frost poem. If everybody in your jiu-jitsu club goes to the gym twice a week, they do a fairly similar program or maybe they go to an S&C class and they get great results from that, go and see what everybody else is doing. Go and look for success and then say, okay, I can bring that success into my own life. We talked earlier about not copying other people and deviating from the plan. In this case, when we're looking with the broad scale, the kind of 10,000 foot view of everything, and we say, okay, for the last four years, all of the youth athletes in my club have been roughly this weight. They've done roughly these numbers in the gym. I should probably be hitting those numbers and trying to be roughly this body weight. 
The same thing happens with your nutrition. The same thing happens with everything else. Don't go and try and find the guru who is doing some special movement camp and expect them to get you way better results than what everybody else gets. At a certain point, we're all human. Some of us have far better capacities in strength, power, speed, intelligence than other people, but we're all human. We'll all react in a fairly similar way. So when we're looking for a path, we don't need to go and find the guru. We don't need to go and find the special carbon buffering system that you're going to use before every training session or before every endurance session. Look at what everybody else has done. Look back at the old Russian texts in s and See what they did to be successful then. And you'll see that's exactly what we're doing now in the modern day. Cardio does not steal your gains for number 15. This is one that goes for a lot of our strength athletes. Most of the other sports watching will already have quite a bit of conditioning. But for our strength sports athletes, an addition of some steady state cardio will only make your training better quality. It should help hopefully improve your levels of lean mass versus your body fat percentage. It should give you more of a work capacity. So if you add in a little bit of steady state cardio and increase that slightly over the weeks and months until you're doing it almost daily, you know, we're talking literally 25 to 30 minutes of approximately zone two cardio, somewhere in the region of 110 to 130 beats per minute, depending on how fit you are. This will only increase your quality of life your blood pressure, your resting heart rate, your ability to do a couple of more sets per week, which it will all add up in the end. It'll let you reduce the amount of time you spend between sets. A lot of you have run the road to your squat program, and you'll know the first couple of weeks, a lot of times people will say, should I be this tired after the volume? Should I be resting 10 minutes between three or four sets of 10? And the answer is no, it shouldn't be that bad. And so one of the ways you can improve that without absolutely destroying yourself is just add in a little bit of cardio. Start off with twice a week, up that to three times a week, then four times a week, and allow that then as much as time is available to you, if you can increase that frequency, a little bit of daily activity in a direct, confined training time. So steps are nice, 10,000, 12,000 steps are very, very, very useful in terms of general health and body fat percentage and increasing your needs. But when we want to increase our conditioning a little bit more direct than that, we need to do a segmented block of training and low intensity steady state cardio or LIS is a very valuable way to do that and would encourage everyone watching this to add in a little bit because it really, really won't affect your training. Look, very long cycles, very long runs, high intensity interval training will all take away from your resources but a little bit of steady state training is so valuable. The final one on our list of 16 things to make yourself better in 2024 is to finish what you started. And this really comes from the annals of within Seeker Strength. This comes from the thousands of emails we get, people wanting to onboard onto a program or maybe come onto some coaching or in a consultation. And they'll say, oh, I ran this program for six weeks, then my knees got sore and I stopped. Or I did weightlifting for two years, then I kind of got fed up with it and I stopped. If you make a decision to do something in 2024, make sure you follow through on it. Maybe it's something where you planned out 12 weeks of a strength cycle. After eight weeks, you ended up having to go away on a work trip. You missed 10 days of training and now suddenly you kind of just fall off the bandwagon. You never peak at the end. You might not have even hit any PBs throughout the cycle. And now suddenly you're kind of in limbo, treading water, trying to figure out where you're going. If that happens to you, you're eight weeks into a strength cycle, something big happens in your life, maybe you have to move house, maybe you have to go away for a work trip, come back, get back on the wagon and finish that strength cycle out before you move on to something else. This is obviously really easy to picture with training, but it happens in almost every aspect of our lives. Whatever you are doing, finish it out to the point where you've agreed with yourself to finish it. Not only will you get better results overall, but it will also make the next round of goal setting and the next lot of programming so much easier to achieve. Every time we tick off one of those boxes, every time we go through one of those full strength training or speed training blocks and we finish everything out as much as we agreed with ourselves we would, it becomes so much easier to go and do that again and to understand the process even better. Thanks for watching this video. If you like that, let us know in the comments. Check out the Seek a Strength app at iOS or Android if you're looking for appropriate training this year for any of your strength-related goals or your conditioning goals now as the conditioning program will be on the app this month. Second block of Becoming a Horse will be out in the coming weeks, so look forward to trying that. But check it out if you have any other goals related to training.